Good to go. All right. Hello, everyone. I'm Kim Mack. Welcome to the ninth event in the 2021 iteration of the Popular Music Books and Process series, a collaboration between the Journal of Popular Music Studies, IASPM US, and the Pop Conference, which has a new host institution, the Clive Davis Institute of Recorded Music at NYU. As always, thank you to my co-organizers, Eric Weisbart and Carl Wilson. Last week, we had a wonderful conversation between Anthony Reed and Vijay Iyer about Anthony's new book, Soundworks, Race, Sound, and Poetry and Production. And next week, on March 30th at 5.30 p.m., and please note the different time, Hanif Adurakib will be here to talk about his forthcoming book, A Little Devil in America. And in case you're unaware, you can find the full 2021 schedule for popular music books and process events on the IASPM US website under the Journal of Popular Music Studies tab, as well as previous recorded sessions on Eric's YouTube channel. Today, we're excited to have Rob Kenner, Aidan Levy, and Yuval Taylor here, who will talk about their biographies, The Marathon Don't Stop, The Life and Times of Nipsey Hussle, just published by Atria Books, Saxophone Colossus, The Life and Music of Sonny Rollins, In Progress and to be published by Hachette, and Dreams Unwind, Stevie Nicks, Lindsey Buckingham, and The Heyday of Fleetwood Mac, In Progress and to be published by W.W. Norton, respectively. Rob Kenner is one of the most prolific and influential voices in hip hop publishing. A founding editor at Vibe, Kenner joined the startup team of Quincy Jones's groundbreaking Hip Hop Monthly in 1992. During a 19 year run at Vibe, he edited and wrote cover and feature stories on iconic cultural figures ranging from Tupac Shakur to Barack Obama, as well as writing the acclaimed column, Boom Shots. Kenner's writing has appeared in Complex, Genius, Mass Appeal, Pigeons and Planes, Ego Trip, Poetry Magazine, The New York Times, and Billboard. He's also produced and directed documentary shorts on the likes of De La Soul, Nas, and Post Malone. As an editor at Vibe Books, Kenner worked on the New York Times bestseller Tupac Shakur and contributed to the Vibe history of hip hop. He went on to co-author VX, 10 Years of Vibe Photography, and produced the book Unbelievable, a biography of the notorious B.I.G., by Chio Hudari Coker Jr., which was optioned for the motion picture Notorious. Aidan Levy is currently at work on Saxophone Colossus, The Life and Music of Sonny Rollins, um, that will be published by Hachette Books in 2022. The first full biography of the jazz tenor saxophonist written with Rollins's participation. The book was supported by a fellowship from the Leon Levy Center for Biography. Um, he's the author of Dirty, Bur Dirty Boulevard, The Life and Music of Lou Reed, uh, that was published by Chicago Review Press in 2015, and is editor of Patti Smith on Patti Smith, Interviews and Encounters, and that was published in 2020 by Chicago Review Press. His book chapter, Pick Up Them Cliffords, Amiri Baraka, Clifford Brown, and the Coinage of Currency, was recently published in Some Other Blues, New Perspectives on Amiri Baraka, edited by Jean-Philippe Mar Marcoux, with an introduction by Fred Moten. His work has appeared in Jazz Times, The Village Voice, The New York Times, and The Nation. He is a doctoral candidate in the Department of English and Comparative Lit Literature at Columbia University, where he is co-convener of the African American Studies Colloquium and works with the Center for Jazz Studies. Yuval Taylor is the author of Zora and Langston, A Story of Friendship and Betrayal, and co-author of Darkest America, Black Minstrelsy from Slavery to Hip Hop, and Faking It, The Quest for Authenticity in Popular Music. He edited three volumes of African-American Slave Narratives and The Future of Jazz, and his writings have appeared in Best Music Writing 2009, The Antioch Review, The Guardian, and other publications. For 30 years, he was a book editor, first at DeCapo Press and then at Chicago Review Press, and has worked with a large number of America's best music writers. After the discussion, there'll be a Q&A, which Eric will moderate, Please put your questions in the chat as they come to you, and Eric will find them at the end of the discussion. Um, you can also put comments there as well. So now I'll turn things over to Rob, Aiden, and Yuval. Hi. We agreed that I would go first. Um, I'm just going to read the beginning of my book in progress, which is probably going to change completely uh, by the time it's published, but I wanted to get um, just to, I wanted to give you a sense of, of what I'm doing. Uh, it starts with an epigraph. 
It is, in many ways, one of the greatest love stories ever told. It's like one of the great romances of the century. We both tried to kill each other. Stevie Nicks, 2013. <laughs> First chapter is called Damn Your Love, Damn Your Lies. In the song, it's a windy morning just after dawn. Someone is running, watching, listening, staying in the shadows, and hating. The hatred is all-encompassing. It's for the lies, the passion, the darkness, the light. The music is soft, foreboding, in a minor key, then it builds. The three singers are in close harmony, but their voices are wavering. The audience is screaming like a frenzied mob. The guitarist gets loud. He seems to shred the strings with his fingers. He refuses to use a pick. Many nights the guitar is smeared with his blood. He yells as he sings, his axe howls. He's portraying a demon caught up in his anger. The undisputed star, the witch portraying an angel wrapped in chiffon with feathered blonde hair keeps looking to the side, not ahead at the crowd, stealing frightened glances at the guitarist. Between verses, she moans. In the song, it's now dusk and the wind keeps blowing. The runner, sticking to the shadows, shunning the light, remembers the lover's promise of an eternal if painful bond, remembers how that promise was betrayed. The woman is kneeling on the floor now, banging a tambourine on the stage. Then she rises. The drummer looks panicked as the demon and the angel fervently sing about what's still keeping them together at the end of this decade of excess and dashed hopes, despite the hatred, the chain. The enigma at the heart of Fleetwood Mac and the reason that legions of fans swear their devotion to the band is the relationship of Stevie Nicks and Lindsey Buckingham. One-time lovers and long-time collaborators, their love and hate for each other surfaced in every performance they gave together. They realized that their fans fed on their relationship, so they dramatized it over and over again, lancing a wound to keep it fresh. It was grand opera in a stadium full of tension and release. In the late 1970s, Fleetwood Mac recorded Rumors and Tusk, two of the greatest albums of the decade and of the century. Rumors remains one of the top 10 best-selling albums in history. Most of the band members, rock critics, and many fans consider Tusk, while not nearly as commercial, their artistic pinnacle. In Rumors, guitarist producer Lindsey Buckingham slickly packaged the real heartbreak that band members were going through, leaving the raw emotions intact, but giving them an irresistible pop sheen. On Tusk, he stripped the songs to their bones, desentimentalized them, making them emotions even raw. After the Tusk tour, the band almost broke up for good. Fueled by cocaine and alcohol, the members had all pushed themselves beyond their limits and had been severely damaged in different ways. The excess had taken its toll. When they reunited for their next album, Mirage, the emotions were muted, the music superficial. In the years since then, through lineup changes and solo careers, Stevie and Lindsay have continued to produce brilliant performances, but have never been able to recapture the sparks that made their 70s heyday so compelling. In April 1976, during the recording of Rumors, Fleetwood Mac appeared on the Midnight Special, a weekly Friday night music extravaganza that aired on, in, um, aired on NBC immediately after The Tonight Show to perform Rhiannon, which had been on their previous album. It was Stevie and Lindsay's first appearance on nationwide TV, the tempo was fast and the song swung hard, but there was nothing that ordinary, that out of the ordinary about it, at least not for the first three minutes, for the part of the song that they used to play when they were bucking in a mix before joining Fleetwood Mac. But then they got into the newer part of the song, the coda, and something happened. Chanting, dreams unwind, love is hard to find, Stevie became possessed. She transformed herself into Janis Joplin and Grace Slick shredding her vocals, enacting the shamanistic communion that Rock aspired to, and one-upping her one-time one idols in the process. And her lover, Lindsay, was shredding his guitar alongside her. Rolling Stone would later call the performance the coolest thing in the universe, and it was instrumental to the band's undreamed of success. The dreams did unwind, and love was hard to find. This book tells the story of how and why that happened. Dreams and Wine traces their relationship from the moment Stevie met Lindsay in 1966 through their days in the Bay Area with a band called Fritz, the genesis of their love affair and their work together as Buckingham Mix, their, hire, their hiring by Nick Fleetwood, the making of the album Fleetwood Mac, the, dra the dramatic breakup before and during the recording of Rumors, the exhausting tours before and after each record, and how they came back together hating each other to produce the culmination of 70s rock, Tusk. 
It details not only their relationship, but also the intertwining relationships of Mick Fleetwood, John McVie, and Christine McVie, since Fleetwood Mac became during those years much like a real family. What came after that? Decades of grudging collaborations and bitter acrimony is covered more briefly. Why did I write this book? My aim as a writer is to tell stories from real life that are as powerful, rich in detail, psychologically acute, and emotionally gratifying as those told in my favorite novels, all while eschewing embellishment and remaining 100% true to the facts. That's what I hope I did in my previous book, Zora and Langston, A Story of Friendship and Betrayal, and what I hope to have done here as well. In addition, there are a half dozen albums I've been obsessed with over the decades, and the one I've listened to most often is likely Tusk. Not only does it include many of Stevie's and Lindsay's greatest songs, but it also represents the peak of Christine McVie's songcraft, and the album as a whole has a shimmering sound and a complexity unmatched by any other of the band's records. Lindsay is one of the greatest sound crafters in rock history. Stevie is a brilliant songwriter and mesmerizing performer. There's a lot to dig into when trying to understand their accomplishments. I also wanted to explore the music of the 1970s in general, which I grew up with and think of as the pinnacle of 20th century pop. I wanted to explore some bigger issues about the nature of collaboration, performance, authenticity, celebrity, and fandom. And I wanted to tell the story of how music can freeze time. Lindsay, Stevie and Lindsay went through the devastation of heartbreak and then reenacted that devastation over and over in public performances to legions of adoring fans. No other couple in history has done that, at least not over a 40 year period. What it took for them to do it, the brilliance and elan and fortitude they displayed in the process and what it did to them in the end, that's one subject of Dreams Unwind. But the other subject is how they arrived at that oft reenacted heartbreak. The story that is far more intricate and complex and human than the greatest love story ever told could possibly be. All right, I'm gonna turn this over to Aiden now. It's great stuff, man. Thanks. Yeah, thank you, that was great. Um, so, all right, thank you for having me, everybody. Um, great to be here in Zoom land. I'm coming to you from Lancaster, Pennsylvania, where I've been living for the past, it feels like 25 years, but really it's about eight months. Um, I've, I'd been in New York City for uh, about 12 years prior to that, and, and now I'm out here, but nice to be able to commune with people on Zoom. As somebody was saying, um, there are serious issues I have with the platform, but it does make certain things work like this, like teaching. Um, although I am actually currently on, on strike at Columbia, um, and if anybody's interested in that, you can, you can read about that. Um, difficult situation. Anyway, um, this book that I've, um, that I've been working on um, is a biography of Sonny Rollins. And I started it not long after the publication of um, Dirty Boulevard, the biography of Lou Reed that I, that I wrote that um, incidentally, you've all edited. Um, and I just this uh, just on Saturday um, completed the first draft of the manuscript. So I'm going to read you um, a short excerpt, not of the manuscript because I just can't bring myself to um, yet, um, but of uh, the liner notes for um, an album that that Sonny Rollins put out uh, this past fall. And um, it's called Rollins and Holland. I'm going to read an excerpt from the end uh, of the essay. Um, this was from a collaboration with a, uh, a Dutch bassist named Ruud Jacobs and a Dutch drummer named Han Benick. Um, but this is, this is from the end of the essay and uh, begins after the tour, which was in 1967. As for Sonny, after the tour, he soon became the standard bearer for the tenor saxophone. On July 17, 1967, only two months after Sonny toured the Netherlands, John Coltrane died suddenly. Since they met in 1950, the two tenor titans were close friends and had frequent phone conversations, some hours long. Sonny's John S. was code for John and Sonny, not New York Times critic John S. Wilson, as some mistakenly thought. Coltrane's like Sonny was his homage. 
The Coltrane never came up on the Williamsburg Bridge during Sonny's legendary sabbatical. They practiced together at Sonny's apartment at 400 Grand Street on the Lower East Side and would get into long, wide-ranging discussions. Quote, we talked about a lot of things, music and spiritual matters. It was sort of heady times, Sonny said. These conversations were as expansive as their mutual approach to improvisation. Quote, it was a vast range of topics that we talked about, Sonny said, everything. Sonny replaced Coltrane on a European tour in November 1966, and soon thereafter, Coltrane began canceling his public performances. Um, not many people knew, but Coltrane was suffering from liver cancer. It may have stopped him from performing, but it didn't stop him creatively. As late as June 1967, Michaels Warren reported that Coltrane turned down an engagement at the Vanguard because he was, quote, practicing, working on something new, and he didn't feel ready to play in public yet. It's likely that whatever this new development was, he had discussed it with Sonny. Coltrane told no one about his failing health, yet Sonny could sense that something was not quite right with his musical brother. Quote, I remember one of the last times I talked to John, his voice sounded, I could hear the overtones in his voice, just the tone of his voice. I could hear the bottom tones and I could hear the higher partials. I guess that must have been, he must have been ill at that time. As I look back on it, I think that was around that period, right before he passed and he made his transition. What we hear on Rollins and Holland is undoubtedly influenced by these conversations at the end of Coltrane's life, just as Sonny must have influenced Coltrane's explorations on interstellar space and expression, both recorded in February and March, 1967. Sonny's own omnivorous explorations were perhaps going ever deeper into the terrestrial rather than the interstellar, but they both pushed each other to realize a fuller and even more personal spiritual expression with greater conviction and fewer restrictions. To both of these masters, music and spirituality, Sonny said, were, quote, one and the same. Apropos of that, in 1967, Sonny was contemplating another sabbatical. And in 1968, he went to India to study at an ashram outside Bombay. He was undeterred in his quest for meaning beyond the bandstand, despite the fact that he was voted best tenor saxophonist in the 15th annual Downbeat International Jazz Critics Poll in August 1967, with Coltrane coming in second. To some extent, Sonny was the last jazz immortal left on this spiritual plane. And as his generation has passed in the ensuing decades, this seems truer now than ever. Yet for Sonny, a jazz musician can leave the earth, but his spirit and his music lives on. When Rude Jacobs died on July 18th, 2019, after a long battle with cancer, Sonny, who believes in reincarnation, wrote him a letter. Dear Rude, have been listening to you, me, and Han when we were playing together in the 60s, listening to the possibility of putting out a record from those days. So it was nice that I heard from you again now. We had a lot of fun then, a great time playing together and hanging out together. May our spirits meet again. All blessings, your old friend, Sonny Rollins. I think I'll stop there. Thank you. Um, and um, I will pass it off to Rob, whose uh, book just came out. I just, uh, I saw it at Barnes and Noble over the weekend. Um, it looks beautiful. Congratulations, Rob. Thank you very much. And um, thanks to everybody for turning out. Um, and, uh, you know, it's really cool to have a chance to read. This is the first time I'm reading from the book. So um, I've been talking off the head until now. And uh, I'm going to just start right from the intro and just read a little bit from it and uh, look forward to discussing with everybody here. Um, so the book again is the marathon don't stop the life and times of Nipsey hustle. And, um, it starts with, I tried to, I made a decision right from the beginning. This was not going to be a murder mystery or a book about a dead rapper. Um, but it does open at the memorial service. There seemed no other where, no other place to begin. Um, so the intro is called Top of the Top. And it begins with an epigraph from uh, a song called Outro off the mixtape, The Marathon Continues from 2011. 
And this lyric was a kind of a word of encouragement from Nipsey that he would have wanted something like this done. Um, you know, before I start reading, I just want to say, apart from the GQ profile of Nip and Lauren London, um, there was hardly any decent magazine profile of him written during his career. Uh, and, you know, hundreds of YouTube videos. I don't think he ever said no to a video interview request. And so he always controlled the narrative and he, you know, told his story the way he wanted to tell it, but it had never been put together. So this book is my contribution as a music journalist um, to just try to lay down a foundation to begin to understand someone who I think is really a singular figure in hip hop history and place him into context in American history and Los Angeles history and in the history of hip hop culture. So here we go, top of the top. Um, the epigraph is when it's all over, all that counts is how the story's told. So write my name down, write my aim down to do this my way and carve my own way now. Lauren London walked gracefully to the podium inside the Staples Center, wearing a long white dress and dark glasses. This, bu this building held many fond memories for her and Nipsey Hussle. They loved sitting together courtside at Lakers games. Only two months earlier, she'd come here with him for the 61st annual Grammy Awards when his official debut, Victory Lap, was nominated for Best Rap Album. Lauren had worn white that night too. Nipsey was regal in his black tux and velvet loafers with gold tassels. A red carpet correspondent said the couple looked like they were on top of a wedding cake. Wow, okay, we'll take that, Nip replied. Boog just smiled. He called her Boog, short for L Boogie. Eventually she would go by a new name, Forever and even after, she declared, call me Lady Hustle. The vibe was different as she crossed the stage on April 11, 2019. Had she ever heard the place so quiet? On this occasion, Lauren was accompanied by Samantha Smith, Hustle's younger sister. Nip's close friend, Shadow, and longtime bodyguard, J-Rock, towered behind them in a black suit and matching cap, his golden all money and medallion glinting over his black tie. Nip's little homie BH stood by silently, a blue rag tied around his braids. At the center of the stage, Lauren's beloved lay in a casket like a fallen king, surrounded by a profusion of blue, white, and purple flowers beneath an oversized AMI logo. Never was I prepared for anything like this, she began. So bear with me, y'all. Unseen voices cried out, offering support from all over the cavernous arena. Take your time, Lauren. On a large screen above her appeared a portrait of Hustle and Boog glowing together on the set of his Double Up video in which he played a hustler on the rise and she played the girlfriend who tries to learn the game but folds under pressure a far cry from the strength she was showing now. On either side of that image was Awal Arisku's full-length portrait of Nipsey from California Love, the magical photo spread about the people's champ of West Coast hip hop and New New from ATL that appeared in GQ magazine soon after the Grammys. The piece was a rare public celebration of this intensely private power couple. Our grandchildren will frame this, Lauren wrote when she shared an image from the story on Instagram. There she sat resplendent on a white horse in the streets of the Crenshaw district, her man by her side like some valiant knight from a storybook, Nip Hustle the Great. Their life seemed very much like a fairy tale at that precise moment. And then on March 31st, everything changed. With their three beautiful children, generations of extended family, and another 20,000 or so mourners hanging on every word, 
Lauren somehow made it through her eulogy without breaking down. A million and one emotions flashed across her face as she spoke. I know everyone's hurting, she said, but I'd like to say something to my city, Los Angeles. Y'all from LA, stand up. Without hesitation, 20,000 people moved as one, rising and cheering for her, for hustle, for themselves. Because this pain is really ours, she said. We know what Nip meant to us. We lost an incredible soul. We lost someone very rare to us and we lost a real one. And we won't ever be the same. Lauren's voice grew just a little bit stronger as she began channeling Hustle's words. He used to always say this, she said with a confident flourish. The game is gonna test you, never fold. Stay 10 toes down. It's not on you, it's in you. And what's in you, they can't take away. And he's in all of us. Sparked by the spirit, the Staples Center erupted in applause once more. Lauren let the sound die down before continuing in a softer voice now. Hand on heart, she directed her closing remarks to her man. And to Aramis, the love of my life, you know what it is, she said. Grief is the final act of love. My heart hears you. I feel you everywhere. I'm so grateful that I had you. I love you beyond this earth. And until we meet again, the marathon continues. Hustle's three word rally and cry and the TMC hashtag have become a universally recognized inspirational mantra. At this point, the marathon is much more than the title of a mixtape series or the name of the successful business that Hustle and his brother Black Sam built brick by brick in the heart of a community where so many others had given up. While most folks look at the Crenshaw neighborhood where he grew up and see only gangs, bullets, and despair, Barack Obama wrote in his tribute to Hustle, Nipsey saw potential. I'll stop right there. Um, Rob. Yeah. Uh, hey, did you start writing the book um, before Nipsey Hussle died? Yeah. Um, when when we did the Victory Lap interview um, at the time that um, it was about three or four days after the uh, album was released, he came to. New York to do his press run and um, he came to meet me at 930 in the morning, which is the earliest that any rapper has ever booked an interview with me um, and showed up early uh, and drank his green tea. And we talked to produce what was supposed to be like a five minute YouTube video. Mm -hmm. And we ended up speaking for over an hour um it wasn't the first time that i met him but it was you know the first really sustained conversation and i walked out of that interview i mean you, you there's a lot of professional journalists on this zoom call so you know there's certain conversations that are more than you bargain for you know more than a normal interview and that's what this was for me um i walked out of the room realizing that I had to do more with this than uh, a five minute YouTube video. And at the time, uh, the publication I was working with, Mass Appeal, had already ceased publishing a website. Um, and so I was thinking this ought to be, you know, like a full documentary or a book. And, and I began reaching out, you know, I had met Nip very early in his mixtape run around 2009 with the bullets ain't got no name uh, volume two and then when i was at complex uh, you know that was the time when he he tweeted fuck complex 10 racks for an interview or stop call my management so that whole episode was fresh in my mind um so i already was paying close attention to his his movement um but after that conversation around victory lap i knew that i had an obligation to do something bigger than what, 
you know, the immediate uh, assignment was. So that was the birth of the book really at that moment. And um, I soon gave up on the idea of a documentary film because there's just too many voices that I wanted to get to. And, and, you know, it evolved into a book very soon after that. And, and how 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 long were you working on it before Nipsey passed? Well, Victory Lap was uh, let's see, twenty eighteen. So it was you know a good year. You know uh -huh. the process of you know from that interview, um, and like I say, the the research began very soon after we released that video. So the whole book took about three years. Right. We're coming up on the what, two year anniversary of his passing. Um, on what, the third. What, what's the, what's, what's the biggest difference for you between the early part of the writing and the late part of the, the later part of the writing? I mean, in just to, to, in terms of the writing process and the research and all that. Well, my process of writing is to just accumulate voices and accumulate mm -hmm information um so like producing a draft is late in the process for me i'm i'm just a omnivorous researcher so um but you know the process of starting to reach out to people who i knew that had worked with him um you know or people who just had a unique perspective on him who had champion his music early on and things like that. Um, you know, it was, it was a little easier before he passed. Um, mm -hmm. It was, you know, I've, I've worked on, you know, I worked at Vibe for 17 years, so we've covered triumphs and tragedies. Um, this particular tragedy hit extremely hard and, you know, the sense of, uh, waste and of, you know, despair was very powerful. And, you know, it wasn't something that people were really ready to talk about right away. Um, so I was able to put things together piece by piece, uh, you know, speaking with people who were ready to talk early. And then over time, you know, um, there was actually a, a conversation that I had, you know, soon after, or actually a day or so before the memorial service where um, I had a chance to speak with uh, Nip's brother and sister, um, as well as um, his business partner, David A. Gross, um, who was instrumental in uh, the brothers being able to, you know, buy back the block and, and you know, purchase the the uh, shopping plaza. So that was a key turning point for me, also, and you know, getting their voices into this. Um, and you know, over time, I'm very proud to say, you know, I was able to speak with people that most folks have never even heard of, who played an important part in Nip's development. Um, there's a yeah, I think that was was. One of the greatest things about your book is is the panoply of voices and and all those really disparate viewpoints and different different people who you talk to. Thanks. Right? Yeah, I mean, for someone like Dexter Brown to be left out of the narrative, I think was you know a huge missing piece in understanding Nipsey. And you know, um, for those who haven't read the book yet, um, Dexter Brown is a photographer and a videographer and a swimming coach from Howard University and a graduate of Howard University. His wife was the art director for rap -A -Lot Records for a long time. So he was this interesting character and just a, a radical thinker and uh, someone who studied a lot of the ideas that Nip tapped into very early, um, you know, ideas about you know, ownership and, um, you know, the whole idea of 
being reluctant to sign to a record label and retaining ownership of your intellectual property and things like that was something that Dexter championed. Um, and, but most importantly, you know, Dexter, you know, just by sheer fate, you know, he's, he's from Trinidad decides to move to LA to, you know, start a new adventure as a photographer. Um, he was trained as a civil engineer actually, and brings his, wife who uh, they'll soon have three daughters in in their new home in LA but um they bought this house not realizing they were right in the heart of the 60s and um very early in living in this neighborhood he bumps into cousin Capone who is uh you know one of Nip's early mentors in hip hop and in LA street life and um anyway Dexter sort of feels like cause he might know something about street life. So he says, do you think, you know, you could introduce me to like some real gang members and I can maybe take some cool photos, you know, document that. And cause he's like, I got news for you, bro. You're right in the heart of it. You don't even know you just bought a house in the sixties. And so Dexter opened his home to cause and there was this skinny kid that used to come around and that was Hermius Ascadome. And, uh, you know, one of their first meetings, Hermes literally opened up his coat and had floppy disks hanging, you know, for sale inside the coat. It was like, you know, a scene from a, a movie. Um, so he was always on his hustle, you know, and this was Hermes at a moment when he had just, um, you know, been asked to leave school or people say dropped out. I, I think, you know, it was a mutual agreement to leave the school. There was an accusation that he was, um, responsible for some missing computer parts out of the school computers. And, you know, uh, his family didn't want him living at home if he was not going to school. And, you know, there was a combination of things that happened and he moved in with his granny and had to survive by his wits in the streets. And Dexter's home became a refuge for him, opened up a whole, you know, opportunity where he suddenly had, access to music production equipment and met Cousy Capone and him and his high school friend Rallo were able to set up shop inside this house. And he lived there for years and made music. That's where he got the name Nipsey Hustle was while he was working in Dexter's home. And so, you know, I'm proudest of being able to bring in more detail and, you know, not, not necessarily just go with kind of the industry narrative, because obviously when, you have a 2,700% spike in streams and, you know, all the opportunists kind of flock around and everybody wants to say, well, I'm the person that crafted Nipsey Hussle sound, or I was responsible for, you know, discovering this great thing. And it's important, I think, for the people that tapped in extremely early to get their credit and get their props. And um, Yeah, you know. that was my favorite part of the book, that whole part about Dexter. And, and I was, that was just really Really cool, really cool. I want to bring Aiden in too. We're talking right now about, um, you know, all three of us have experienced writing about, but have experienced by bi writing biographies now about people who are alive and people who are dead. And Aiden, I wanted to ask you to compare what your experience was writing about um, Lou Reed after his death and what your experience is now about writing about Sonny Rollins, who's still very much alive. So I began researching the book on Lou Reed, I would say about a, a year before he passed. And at the time, um, when I told people about it, um, most people that I, I discussed it with were um, their response was something like, um, why, why are you writing a, a book on, on Lou Reed? Um, and, you know, I would give them a long explanation, which I won't, I won't give here. Um, and um, let's see, I, I had just finished the proposal um, in, uh, in June of, um, 
2013. And um, like the, a, a week or something, a um, couple months after he passed, um, there were suddenly something like nine books in process on Lou Reed. And when, when he passed, I thought to my, I mean, I was, you know, I was crushed by this. I mean, he, he was really young. Um, and I, I thought that I would abandon the book um, for similar reasons to what you're describing, Rob, that, you know, maybe people wouldn't really want to do interviews, that kind of thing, you know, lose barely cold. Um, you know, I was worried that, um, you know, if you have a recently deceased subject, then, you know, it might be, um, you might attract people with some kind of vendetta and everybody else will not want to speak. Um, there's that issue. Um, but I would put so much research into it at that point that I thought I can, I'll just do the book and, and see what happens, do it as a kind of tribute. Um, so that was that was that experience um i was able to do quite a few interviews um i can't remember the exact count but um i spent a long time interviewing people um for sonny rollins um a very different story so I started work on the book maybe in late 2015 or 2016 or so, early 2016. And the first thing I did was, and I did this with Lou Reed as well, um, was to find out, you know, what level of participation um, Sonny might want to have in the book, you know, is there another book in process um, just to make sure that, um, you know, I've contacted him. Um, just to, to be clear with Lou Reed, there was an emphatic um, no, that Lou Reed wanted no involvement with the book. I doubt Lou Reed ever heard about the project. Um, although I did um, contact him. Um, but Sonny, with Sonny Rollins, um, I contacted his publicist and we'd worked together before. And um, to my surprise, um, she said that, that she was okay with my working on the book and that Sonny was okay with it. Um, and I, I really was surprised. I, I had thought about um, applying for a fellowship at the Leon Levy Center for Biography, which is run out of the CUNY Graduate Center. And that was how the project really began. So I um, you know, put together uh, some sample material, which was um, based on Sonny's last tour of Europe. Um, it was his first tour of Europe, but it was his last tour before he began his legendary bridge sabbatical on the Williamsburg Bridge. Um, so I wrote that and I did some interviews. I was able to interview a, a drummer named Joe Harris, who I think was 95 at the time that I interviewed him, but he, he was still lucid. Um, he passed away a few months after that. Um, and I, I still wasn't sure if I would... Um, you know, when I would be able to get to the book, um, I, I was still and am still in the middle of a, a PhD program. And um, the book on Sunny is not my dissertation. Um, but uh, so I, I got the fellowship, um, which was um, very surprising to me. Um, and uh, Gary Giddens was running the Leon Levy Center at, at the time. Um, he 
retired. Um, he resigned from uh, the position a, a few months after the fellowship year began. Um, but yeah, so I, I started that and, um, you know, I would do periodic um, interviews with Sonny and I began doing interviews with um, really just anybody um, that I thought might uh, be able to contribute something. And, uh, you know, I made sure that Sonny um, would be okay with this. He said he was. And, um, you know, I thought there was some urgency to, to do the book now um, while, while people are still here. Uh, so since um, 2016, I, I've been able to interview something like 200 people for the book. Um, and I um, perhaps foolishly transcribed the vast majority of these interviews myself. It's not Only, foolish. Not foolish. Um, yeah. It, well, there's a difference when you when you go through and actually transcribe them yourself. But that's um, nice. so, yeah. That that's. You know, just some thoughts on, on the difference here between the two projects. Um, so the book I'm doing is not, and we can talk about this, um, what you might call um, an authorized biography. And I think there, there is oftentimes some confusion about the distinction between an unauthorized or an unauthorized or all of these terms. But, you know, it's not authorized in the sense that... Um, you know, I'm not writing the book with Sonny Rollins. Um, and we were clear about that from the beginning that he would be, you know, open to it. And, um, you know, we could talk, but um, that, you know, it, it would uh, be a project that I was ultimately responsible for. Um, whereas, um, you know, with, with Lou Reed, um, who had, passed on in the middle of the, the process, in the middle of researching, um, you know, of, of course that was never a consideration. Um, you know, I, uh, yeah, I, I guess I'll, I'll leave it at that, but let me just ask, ask you, you all, because, you know, there, there is some uh, thematic relationship between what you did with uh, Zora and Langston um, which, um, when, when, when was it published? Cause I, I feel like it was published a year ago, but it may be two years now. Yeah. It's two years. Two uh, years. well, it's almost two years. Yeah. Yep. Uh, almost. Yeah. Last, yeah. Um, yeah, there is, there is a thematic relationship. I mean, we're dealing with, uh, uh, a man and a woman who are collaborating cl closely on, on a work of art, um, and had a, breakup uh, marked by jealousy and hatred and never forgave each other. Um, so there is, there is that connection. Um, but for me, I'm, I'm coming at it from a very different, um, a, a very different approach than, than you guys, because I have never been a journalist. Um, I have always been an editor and a writer, but not, uh, I've never done any journal, I mean, real hard journalism. The whole process of interviewing is something that's new to me and is making me very nervous. <laughs> um, I, I, you know, the, the Zoran Langston book, there was a great deal of material that I was able to, to get from uh, various university libraries. Um, and um, a lot of uncovered material, material that nobody else had read, um, and I was I, I, it was it was just fantastic to to get that material, and it was also the, the writing was also um, characteristic and full of color, you know, um, and so it was it was great to have that. Now with with uh, Stevie and Lindsay, um, there are hundreds and hundreds of interviews that I've been combing through um, that they've that they have given especially Stevie she just loves to inter be interviewed um, I guess because she's just given so many um, 
and also interviews with um, with other members of Fleetwood Mac. There's Fleet, there's Mick Fleetwood's own two books, and then um, all the members of Fritz have been interviewed by fans at length, and, and they're available on, on fan sites. Um, Javier Pacheco, um, Javier Pacheco, uh, who was the songwriter for Fritz, there was, that was the band that Stevie and Lindsay were in uh, after high school. Um, he has written a great deal about Fritz um, and he's posted a lot of stuff on YouTube and I've um, gone back and forth with him a little bit on, on YouTube comments. Um, and I have had a few other interviews, but I felt like um, I wanted to read as much as possible before doing interviews. So I had all the right questions at hand. I had all the things that I knew I could not get an answer to anywhere else, but by talking to them. But that may not be the wisest thing because it may take me years to to actually get them to open up to me. So <laughs> it's a it's a it's a difficult thing. And and then you know the the difference between writing about about people who have passed away a long time ago and people who are still alive. There's a, there's a lot of a lot of things are, are um, it, it seems it seems like people who are alive in some ways are harder to know um, because there's there's no finality to their to their life there's no way to encapsulate what they've done and who they are they're they seem slipperier, slipperier to me. I don't know if that's your experience, Aiden, or not, but it, there's there seems to be a uh, once once someone is is dead, that there's there's something that that you can. I, I don't know. I, I feel less. I feel I feel less hesitant about about saying things about about dead people. <laughs> can I ask a question? Yeah. Do, do Stevie and Lindsay know about your book? Like, are they cool with it or they're unaware at this point? That... I believe they're unaware. I mean, I have written to their publicist, but uh, I haven't really pressed hard. Uh, it's still something I want to do. Um, and I believe that Stevie might be willing to, might be more willing to talk to me than Lindsay. That's my guess. But I don't know. Because like I love the, the, um, the what you did with Zora and Langston, and you know that's a great example of like zeroing in on a particular part of the story that hasn't been fleshed out, you know. And that's what's so brilliant yeah. in the book is that you you have read everything that's been done, and you said, you know, here's the most interesting bit that nobody's been able to really tangle with. And you plunge right into a specific thing. And it's so cool. You know, in this case of Nipsey, like I said before, there's been so little done. I feel like I'm just laying the first bricks of the pyramid, you know, just the, the basic foundation stuff. And there's a lot more that I hope will be written over time. Um, but with, I'm just curious, like, you know, when you're, compiling your list of questions are you going through all the other interviews and sort of crossing off things that you know already from them and then you know going on to refine just narrower and narrower topics that you want to discuss or do you want pretty to much yeah okay yeah. yeah pretty much i mean yeah i mean there's you know there's there's things i really i really want to know um i mean just for example um Stevie says that that she and Lindsay met in nineteen in the in the around January February nineteen sixty six at a at a meeting of Young Life, which was a, a church um, group that um, was a kind of after school music hangout, um, and they and and you know she was in the room Lindsay was in the room I don't know who walked in on who. And Lindsay was playing. Lindsay started playing California Dreamin', and and um, Stevie joined in. Now Lindsay's account of this meeting is much vaguer, quite different. He never mentions California Dreamin', um, and Stevie says that 
Bob Aguirre was there. He's the one who started the band Fritz, um, another high school classmate of theirs. Um, but Aguirre has never mentioned the meeting. Um, Lindsay has said, said at one point that Stevie played him one of her own songs, which Stevie never mentions. So I just want to, <laughs> I would love to talk to them all three about, about this, this meeting and, and try and clarify all the questions I have about it. And the song California Dreaming just seems too apposite. It seems like an afterthought because it, because it has the words walked into a church on a winter's day. And this was a meeting in a church atmosphere on a winter's day. So it makes me wonder whether that's really the song that they were singing together. <laughs> um, you know, because Stevie loves to tell stories and, and uh, tell them over and over again. And, you know, in some versions, Lindsay's playing piano, some he's playing guitar, sometimes he's sitting on the floor, sometimes, you know, it's, it's just all, all these different versions. It's, you know, so yeah, <laughs> that's the kind of thing I'm trying to get at. I want to set the scenes. I mean, I love, I love, you know, parts of the, when I read books and when I, when I write them, I want to set concrete scenes where you can actually see the protagonist interact. And, uh, and that, so, so getting these minute details is key. Yeah. It's interesting to, you know, that you're bringing up this idea of setting scenes um, and, you know, that within um, the biography, there are these moments that can feel cinematic. I'm sure we've all yeah. thought about that. Um, you know, of course, every biographer's dream is that, that their work gets optioned for film and or becomes a series. <laughs> it happens to so few of us. Uh, mm -hmm. But I was thinking about it um, yesterday when I, because I just began trying to cut the manuscript. As I said, I just finished it several days ago. I've had only about one day to just appreciate the fact that I completed a draft before, um, you know, dusting off uh, the, the hatchet. Um, so now I'm, I'm really trying to cut it about in half. And one thing I've been thinking about is um, just, you know, is it a scene or, or is it a fact? Um, because there are these moments where you really portray a scene and it does have a kind of cinematic feel to it. And then there are, there are all these things that happen in a biography that, you know, can't really happen in a movie that it's, it's almost just factual information. Um, you know, and I think that, I mean, I, I'd like to hear what you guys think about this because, um, you know, sometimes to me that feels boring, but, you know, there's a place for facts within a biographical narrative. I found when I began cutting that I have a tendency always to reach for the scene. Um, but, you know, sometimes it happens in the middle of a digression. I'm really digressing. <laughs> Sonny Rollins is not even in the narrative. And suddenly like, here we are and somewhere in, in the 18th century, uh, you know, discussing a 13 gun salute. And I'm thinking, okay, this has got to go. Um, it's like, we have a scene here Maybe, maybe a fact would be better if it's in there at all. Um, but yeah, I, I just wonder, is this something that either of you has, has thought about when you're writing um, in terms of this question of just setting a scene? Hmm. Are you always going for a scene or are you, are you ever saying, no, this, is, this part's not a scene at all? Yeah, you can't all so. yeah. yeah, you, you can't, can't always, always set scenes, right? You can't do yeah, that. You can't always set scenes, yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's definitely something you want to aim for, but you can't always do it. There's always going to be a necessity for some explanatory stuff, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. And I'd like to just say a word in defense of lengthy digressions and, and rabbit please, holes. Please do. Yeah, please do. because I think that's, what, that's where the good stuff often happens. Like, you know, word to Herman Melville, like, you know, Moby Dick digressions are awesome. And there, there's a, there's a um, Instagram book review that came out about the marathon. Don't stop the other day, which made me very happy. Um, and I, what, what they said was, you know, cause I, I loaded a lot of background about trying to understand, like one of the things I was wrestling with in the book was 
how does someone as intelligent and as uh, just enlightened in every way as Aramis Saskadome end up joining the rolling sixties, right? How does that decision happen? And to do that, to, to really grapple with that, um, you know, people have asked him that question. We talked about it a little bit when I spoke with him, but I wanted to really understand like all about, you know, the history of California and America and, you know, understand what we even mean when we talk about gangs and, you know, I mean, now everybody's heard about the Proud Boys, right? You know, we're all aware of the Proud Boys at this moment, but, you know, uh, for a long time in popular culture in America, you know, our idea of gangs was either, you know, like Scarface and, you know, that kind of stuff or else it's like boys in the hood. And, you know, so you have to understand a lot more. You need to understand the context. And so that's what I was trying to do with, um, you know, delving into the history of, you know, groups like the Spook Hunters, you know, Slauson Boys and, um, you know, learning about that uh, required delving into even conversations about redlining and, you know, um, restrictive covenants in property deeds and things, you know, and, and gang injunctions and, you know, just a lot of a lot of background. And so anyway, this Instagram book reviewer described the beginning parts of the book as, you know, kind of like going uphill and climbing up a steep hill. But in the end, she felt it was worth it. And I was happy that I didn't lose the reader there. And that's always the worry, right? That you're going to just lose the reader. They're going to not understand where, why we have to read about all this other stuff when we really want to hear. I'm sorry, my my text messages are going crazy right now. I apologize. Um, but if there were not those digressions, you would just, you know, why bother reading a book at all? You know, like it's, it's, it's a in-depth look. We're taking a deep dive here. So cherish the digressions. Um, they say, kill your darlings, right? In editing process, that's like a cliche of editors. Like, you know, if you're too fond of something, cut it out. I don't believe in that. And so, you know, I don't either. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. But that, but, the, but I do think that scenes are, I mean, the, the, some of the most memorable parts, certainly the most memorable parts of Dirty Boulevard for me were, were the specific scenes of Lou Reed at his home interacting with the people he lived with. I mean, just, and, and those, those Aiden got from, um, from, you know, interviewing those people who he was with. And that's just like, you know, that those were just unforgettable scenes. Uh, yeah. Thank you. I, I just want to um, try to field this question here about interviewing and interviewing uh, reluctant subjects just on that, on that point. Um, because you do get, um, you know, you do find scenes through interviews oftentimes. Um, you don't always get a reaction. You know, sometimes you'll start an interview and you'll get a feeling that somebody's just going to say, oh yeah, he was great. And that's going to be, you know, more or less the, the through line of the interview. And there might not be much in the way of a scene and not many facts or details. But um, the question here is about interviewing people about the recently deceased uh, specifically. I'm um, Ada. If, yeah. it's, if it's okay, we have this habit of asking the people who have questions to just quickly come on screen and ask them. So to sort of okay, got, great, great. So okay, so if so uh, if you don't mind, because I was thinking it was around. This was a good moment to start bringing in some of the questions. We'll have Carl actually in, introduce yeah. his question and then just continue right on where you were going. Great. Um. Hi. Um. Yeah. I mean, this you've. You've all touched on this, um, and it's something that I've been dealing with lately. Um, you know, the sensitivities that people have, particularly after a tragic death and in, and in the quick um, aftermath of a death. Um, and I guess I'm wondering, you know, partly it's how you approach constructing that material, but also just on a simple level, 
making the case for people that they should participate in a biography and how you do that when people feel that, you know, maybe they don't want to take skeletons out of the closet um, and all of those kinds of things. So I'd just be interested in your approaches and the stories you have about that. Um, do, you want, do you want to start, Rob? Well, let me jump I'd in. Be, yeah. No, no, I'm happy um, to, to say, I mean, it, it is for, for this book, particularly after March 31st, that was extremely challenging part of putting this book together. Um, I felt the same obligation. I mean, first of all, I dealt with my own sense of shock and loss not to make it about me, but it was, you know, I, I cared about Nipsey Hussle as a person. Um, I feel like our conversation, particularly the, the marathon, um, excuse me, the victory lap interview changed the way I thought about my life. You know, he's someone that talked about how the rules of, you know, the music business and, content creation were not made up by creators and they were made really to exploit people um, who created content. And that was something that resonated with me uh, as a person that was working at websites. And, you know, it just, I, I, I picked up a lot of game from Nipsey in our conversation. I cared about him. Um, so when he passed away, I went through my own sense of shock and loss. Um, but then I, returned to my determination that somebody needed to really put his story down properly. And so I was able to just really approach people on that basis. And each person, it was a one by one process. Um, and it was a lot to do with like one person vouching for me to the next person or suggesting, you know, once, once I was able to explain, you know, in a, in a very earnest way, I believe, Nip's story and the story of those around him uh, has not been properly told. And I believe it's important. And I believe that, um, you know, he wanted not just himself to win, but his whole team, you know, and because of that, there was a sense that, you know, this would be something he would want, you know, and, that's why I also included that epigraph that I read earlier, you know, when it's all over, all the counts is how the story's told, you know, even at, you know, I would share details of like at the end of the interview that we did around victory lap, the last thing he said was like, and he did a lot of interviews, you know, but he said, that was really dope. You're on your shit, you know, and it's just things that gave me inspiration to go up against any resistance that might've been countered. Um, I felt a sense of, you know, purpose that this needed to happen, you know, and as a result, um, you know, that, that stood me in good stead, I think, you know, um, but it's hard. It's the hardest part of this book was, you know, winning people's confidence, letting them know I was serious about this. This was not just you know, somebody from nowhere coming in to, you know, write one of those books that, you know, there's, there's an endless amount of books about Big and Pac, for instance, who, you know, where they are just simply, you know, murder mysteries or, you know, just exploitative projects. And, you know, I think it's important to make your intention clear and your motivation clear and just let people feel that in an honest way, you know? And uh, that's how I did it one by one. Yeah, it, I mean, I would, I don't think I have too much to add to that. Um, I think that was well put, um, but in terms of approaching interview subjects, I, just, um, you know, I try to, yeah, explain that I'm trying to tell an honest story, um, that I care about the subject. Um, I, I've never met, a, I mean, I've, I don't, 
recall meeting a writer where I really felt the writer did not care about the subject. But I think that there's, there is this idea, um, you know, and I mean, I, I'm speaking to, to writers here. So, you know, we, I imagine no one here really feels this way, but that, you know, writers are just intrusive that um, we're like, just, yeah, you know, looking for skeletons in the closet. We're trying to dig up dirt and just looking for something like juicy. Um, and people I think are concerned that really that's your intent, that you're just looking for like to, t to tell a tabloid story and, you know, just do sort of like a hit and run. Um, it, it's just gonna be some, some kind of hatchet job. I think that's always the concern. Um, and, you know, that as you were saying, like, you know, are you knowledgeable on the subject? Have you done your research? Um, you know, or do you have absolutely no idea what you're talking about? I think people are concerned about that. So I always try to approach and just demonstrate that, yeah, I have done my research. I do want to tell an honest story. I do care about the subject. And, you know, I'm, on, I am not only here to, you know, I'm not looking for you to dish gossip. Um, do people, you know, in interviews sometimes dish gossip? Yes, they do. And, you know, I don't always put it in the book. I would only do that if I think it's relevant to the story. I try to make that clear to people too, when I approach them, that I'm not just looking, you know, to sensationalize this person's life. I mean, these are human beings we're talking about, you know? So uh, Jeffrey Ward said something interesting in a lecture that, you know, I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but um, basically that um, whatever was going on behind closed doors in the bedroom, he didn't feel was necessarily appropriate for the biography that if he didn't know, you know, this type of detail about his best friend, then maybe it shouldn't be in the biography. Um, you know, I think that there could be exceptions to that, but I, I try to at least be sensitive to the fact that, you know, especially if we're talking about living and, and deceased subjects that uh, especially the subject is, you know, deceased or recently deceased, that it doesn't read like some kind of, you know, post-mortem. And that's obvious that you have not done that with your book, Rob. So I just want to say, um, you know, it's a tremendous piece of work. And, uh, you know, I appreciate the honesty and the integrity of it. Um, and that's the type of thing that, you know, I think it, it helps, um, you know, I think it helps uh, all of us deal with future reluctant interview subjects, you know, because people do get the sense of like, oh, yeah, well, you know, oh, a biographer. I mean, you know, I'll just, I'll, I'll leave it at that. But um, yeah, that, that's how I do it. I also, I mean, I, I can talk about, you know, do I call people? Do I send letters, emails? I know people who do like to, uh, if they can't reach a reluctant subject, they actually will like sometimes show up at their house. Um, I've never done that ever in my life. Um, you know, but I, I do oftentimes uh, make phone calls, um, which, um, you know, many people have, I sometimes get a skeptical look at that. Like, oh, you actually call people on the phone? That's a little creepy. And like, you know, but many of my interview subjects, especially for the Sonny Rollins book, are, you know, octogenarians. Some of them are over 90. They don't necessarily have an email account. Uh, you know, I can't always reach them that way. And they don't find it so creepy and weird if I call them on the phone. So I also sometimes just call people on the phone. Sometimes they don't have an answering machine. Um, I've had, there's a guy I interviewed for the Sonny Rollins book who lives in New Orleans. David Lee, a drummer, brilliant drummer. Um, and, you know, I, I heard from a contact at the Jazz Foundation of America that, um, that we could talk, that, you know, he said, here's how you reach him and this is what you do. And I started calling him, you know, after a while, it would just ring and ring and ring and then it would start beeping. I'd say, oh, I'll never reach this guy. And maybe about a year later, maybe more, I called again and, and he just picked up the phone and said, yeah, let's, let's do it. Um, it happens that way sometimes. Um, that was, the, that was what happened with Jimmy Heath as well. Um, but anyway, that's kind of two different approaches to the question. Let's, uh, let's bring Scott Saul into here, Richard Pryor biographer, Scott Saul, I should Hi. say. Hi, this is great. These are all amazing projects. Um, I'll just say, uh, following on this line of inquiry, I think that civilians, they have a lot to be worried about when a biographer calls them up because in fact, they hold stories very close to themselves. And these sometimes very private stories through the biographer are going to suddenly be available to 
possibly millions of people. And they're, they're right to worry about the implications of that. I think when people don't think about that, it, that's when they suffer <laughs> as a result of just the biographer being like, well, you told me this to me in an interview. I, I knew it was kind of uh, incredible. And so I put it in my book, you know, so I, I understand the reluctance. Um, and suddenly if a biographer came to me to talk to, I, I would probably have that same reluctance uh, and want to talk to them off on background before because I'll get about, about other stuff. Anyway, but um, I, I wanted to get, what well, you always talking about how did they really do California, play California Dreaming? It seems too perfect a story. We all know as biographers that these kind of stories that get retold and, and then they get more and more sanded down until every detail is kind of perfect. And I, I just have this question about how to deal with conflicting accounts in, as a biographer. Um, I, you know, part of biography is a nonfiction genre. So of course we do want to figure out what actually happened. Did this happen in Antwerp? Or did it happen uh, in Alabama? You know, um, there there are matters of fact, but oftentimes there's a lot of questions that are about interpretation, and um, and the question is, you know, how do you, as a, as a biographer, use those conflicts, harness those conflicts, maybe make something out of those conflicts, uh, and and when do you choose to actually suppress the conflicts, put it into a footnote? Um, how do you, how do you, because, you know, I know that there's a question about how much the reader wants to go into the space of kind of the postmodernness of, of truth. And, uh, you know, well, what really happened? Well, we'll have to live in this space of indeterminacy, you know? Uh, so I just think if, if the different biographers, Eric, might speak to this, a particular conflicting accounts that you've been able to, to use or ones that kind of you had to turn away from. For me, my approach was for for when, with Zoran Langston. I mean, Zoran Langston gave very very different accounts of their breakup, um, and and the and they give they gave very different accounts of their of their of their collaboration as well. And my my approach was just to dig deep and try to confirm everything that they were saying. And I found. And I was able to identify when when they were lying and when they weren't. And I was I I tried to take the most fearless approach I could to this question. I tried to I tried to say I'm the arbiter here. Um, I'm I'm writing the biography. It's up to me to say who's right and who's wrong, who's lying, and who's telling the truth at each point. Um, when Zora tells Charlotte Mason something that is. To me, it, there were things that were just clearly lies that she would tell Mason, and and then um, Langston was was clearly telling lies to his lawyer about certain other things. And I just wanted to to clarify: okay, this is this is what actually happened, and this is why they're lying, and this is what you know the the whole. I, I just felt like it, it's 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 my it's not just my prerogative, but it's my duty as a as a biographer to um, to clarify exactly who's telling the truth and and who's lying. Other answers? I have a feeling there's almost like different personalities on the subject. Yeah, I, I think so. Um, I mean, the, there's this idea that, you know, like um, in a courtroom, no one mistakes the sound of truth ringing out kind of thing. Uh, like, but does that apply here with California Dreaming? Because you're, you're dealing with questions of fact and questions of memory. Um, sometimes you're dealing with uh, personalities or a certain kind of potential embarrassment. You know, we're talking about a very public book project here. Um, so will you bend the truth? Um, uh, you know, I've had experiences with a range of these. When I do interviews, I always have a sense um, as I do with, with friends of mine as well, as to what is their propensity to um, play fast and loose with reality. Uh, you know, some people like to kind of spin yarns and some people um, just stick to the cold, hard facts. Um, and it's, it's usually, I think, um, I can tell. And I, you know, I go to the ends of the earth in order to, to fact check. Um, which we have to do ourselves, of course. I mean, publishers don't, you know, pay a fact checker for the, you know, uh, 183,000 facts that are in the book. Um, 
and it's great when you can you know have that but uh for the most part we have to do our own fact checking so i always try to check the facts sometimes when i have conflicting stories um i can see what matches up and what doesn't but where i really am going with this question is and this is something I, i've thought about quite a bit um because i get a, if people ask me this a lot um and fellow writers ask me this a lot you know like can you trust an interview subject i find the people say to me you know i find that oral history is one of the most notoriously unreliable sources of information. And I, you know, I don't, I don't buy that. I don't feel that way. And I don't subscribe to that position. I think that sometimes um, oral history interviews um, can be uh, unreliable. Sometimes people's memories are false. Um, sometimes they remember things that did not happen. Um, sometimes they forget things that did. Uh, the narratives don't always match up. But I find, generally speaking, that um, mo the vast majority of people I've interviewed um, are not lying. And why do I say that? Like, how would you know? Are you have, how can we say that you're not just the most gullible dude in the room? Of course, I mean, you're, you're like a biographer. You sound like you're pretty gullible. Uh, well, you know, like I said, I really go to confirm the facts. And time and time again, I find that the fact checks out. Almost always. Every once in a while, that's not the case but like 99% of the time, it's because somebody was telling tall tales. Um, so what do I do with the tall tale? You know, I, I don't always, keep, I rarely will keep the tall tale if it's turned out to be entirely false, but usually there's some grain of truth in it. And the story actually did happen. And, you know, over time, as I interview more and more people, the, the true story begins to, to come out. Um, anyway, so that, that, those are just some jumbled thoughts on that subject. But the, the bottom line for me is that I tend to trust, um, I tend to trust the interview subject first. You know, I have a kind of innocent until proven guilty perspective when it comes to interview subjects, as opposed to many people, I think, who approach it skeptically with this, like, you know, kind of hermeneutic of suspicion, like, don't trust anything anybody tells you. And I think, well, why, what, do they have any reason to lie? Let's think about it first. Rob, did you have one of these print the facts versus print the legend kinds mm. of dilemmas with the bio? Yeah, I mean, Scott, you ask an excellent question. And I think a couple of things that need to be said at the outset is that hip hop, you know, has a cherished tradition of telling tall tales and that's part of the fun, right? And then the other would be that, you know, specifically in gang culture, there's a practice of using deceptive and deliberately misleading language to cloak people's identities and true relationships and just you know it's like patois in the caribbean is language where you can speak about the slave master right in front of them and they won't know what you're saying you know and i think that some of the language in gang culture has a similar function you know in a when you read the book, you'll understand what I mean. But anyway, a couple of examples come to mind. So the story about why Nipsey left high school, why Hermes Askedom left high school, you know, um, he told the story in a couple of interviews that he was accused of stealing parts from computers um, in the, in the school. And it's definitely true that he built his own computer uh, and was able to use it to make beats. His whole life is this quest to be able to become a rapper. He, you know, this is one of the things I learned in the book is he, way before he was out in the streets, you know, he wanted to be a rapper. You know, he was like six or seven years old when Criss Cross put out Jump and he loved that record. He wanted to be Criss Cross. You know, he wanted to be Bow Wow. He, he was on a mission to be a rap star before anything. And, you know, the, the caricature that people have of him, you know, for a lot of his career, if you knew about him at all, it's like, oh, he's a real gangster. He's really in the streets and, you know, he's really about that life. But when you met this person, he was so personal and intelligent and thoughtful and everything that we don't think about when we think of the cliche of a gangbanger. Right. So um, anyway, Nip said, I didn't take the computer parts. Then I spoke to people that 
had a different opinion of what happened, you know, and people that were pretty close to him without revealing sources. And I ended up kind of copping a plea on that one. I didn't want to, you know, say he said he want he said he did and someone or he said he didn't someone else said he did I, what i said i tried to to just use a an easy touch on that particular point i just said you know honesty was generally his policy but you know this is what he says happened you know and you can kind of read between the lines as you choose on that one um the story of how he got his rap name um is a story that he told a lot in interviews. Um, and, you know, I, rather than printing that story over and over, I wanted to talk to Gucciavelli, young Gucciavelli, who was his, his friend at Dexter's house who gave him the name. And that story was more complicated than his anecdote, you know, which was a, a fun anecdote. You know, and the basic anecdote is that they were all in the studio this is a time when no one was making any money from rap. Uh, you know, some of the big homies like Cuzzy and Gooch had hustles that they could bring some money in. Sometimes Dexter and his wife would fix them some food. But basically, they were just they had access to the equipment. They had a safe place to work, but no real money coming in. Um, and they were hungry and working a few days on some music and Nip was like, fuck this. I'm going to hit the block. I'm going to get some money. And he comes back with in various tellings of the story and in various interviews, you know, with a big bag of weed, a bottle of cognac, some fried chicken, you know, just hit the jackpot, came back to the studio, you know, and, Gooch, as Nip walks in, says, wow, look at this kid. He's like Nipsey Hussle. Now, it's a play on words based on the fact Gooch is an older generation than young Aramia. So he knew who Nipsey Russell was, and it was, it was a fun thing. And when I spoke to Gooch about it, he said, okay, yeah, I've heard him tell that story. That's not exactly how I remember it, but I was smoking a lot of weed and drinking a lot of beer at that time. So I might be a little hazy on it, but basically, you know, we were up on branding. We knew he was special. We knew he needed a rap name. You know, he was going by Ermi or E previously he had gone by concept. You know, he had, he was rapping way before people knew him as Nipsey hustle. He was flying out to Atlanta at the invitation of a Fanny Shakur to perform at a Tupac, posthumous Tupac album launch event as concept, you know, like, so he was just destined for something, you know, destiny called this young man, but, um, you know, the Gooch and Dexter would have conversations saying, you know, we got to come up with a, a name for, for, army because he's really special and you know like they understood branding they had books about branding they were thinking about it and and it just he said i'll, I'll think of something i'm just gonna meds it and it's gonna come to me and the the lightning bolt just hit it did hit you know on the occasion of him coming back but you know he's a little hazy about the details so i just said the way nip remembers it this is what happened and then gooch I don't have him directly contradict the tale, but he said, you know, I had been trying to think of a name and I, I wanted to brand this young man and come up with something. And, and he had to explain who Nipsey Russell was and all of that. And you can tell when he's asked these questions um, in interviews, you know, he was not someone that watched Nipsey Russell, but it's a great name. And that's actually the name got him the record deal, which he didn't want a record deal. But when, when he ended up signing to Epic Records, Johnny Shipes from Cinematic Records, who was famous for Sean Kingston, who had become very successful because of the success of Sean Kingston, but wanted to do rap. He just had a relationship with the head of Epic Records at the time. And he said, I got this kid from LA. His name is Nipsey Hussle. And the boss at Epic was like, oh, you mean like Nipsey Russell? That's great. Just sign him. I don't need to hear the music. That's great. Let's go. You know? And so that's what's in the name, you know? So it's, Anyway, that's how I dealt with it. 
Um, again, I'm laying the first blocks of the pyramid in this book and trying to do it in a way that's, you know, going to give sure footing for people in the future to build upon that. Well, the thing that I was dealing with in, 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 in Zoran Langston that I'm dealing with now is, is, is an instance where the, the protagonists are trying to establish a, a, uh, a narrative that tells their own story. I mean, Langston wrote an autobiography that tells their story in a very particular way and are deliberately distorting what happened in order to make themselves look less devious. Um, and, you know, and I, I think that's true, that, that's definitely true with, with, with Langston. And I just had to call him out, you know, when he, when he says things that in his autobiography that just are not, are not, um, are, are just, they're, they're kind of putting, pushing the blame on, on, on Zora for things that, that that he shouldn't have pushed the blame on her for, um, and and there's a condescension in there, a, a very palpable condescension in his work um, when it comes to Zora, and and I felt like I had to point that out, and I had to take sides right there. Um, when I'm dealing with Stevie, she, Stevie and Lindsay have always basically when they got when they became Buckingham Knicks, and and or maybe when they joined Fleetwood Mac, I don't know when. But at some point they agreed that they were going to tell the story that they got together after Fritz broke up. Um, and, but when you talk, but when, you know, the interviews, the very detailed interviews with other members of Fritz, they were going out together for about six months or, or a year before the band broke up. I just think it's important for me to actually say that and not, <laughs> and not, you know, and, and not say, well, they say this, but the band members say that. I just, I feel like I, I can, I can, I can, I, I, as a biographer, I have a, I have the prerogative to, to say, okay, these people are probably right. And these people are probably fudging things a bit. Well, we're running on the late side. Um, I want to just ask Sam to quickly ask his question, which I think will be our final one for today. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for, for all your work. I, I had a question for Rob. I mean, I think I've, we've heard uh, Nipsey talk about his trips back home to his, his, his native area on his dad's side. And, and it's, it comes at a particular time, right? First one, 18, he spends three months there, goes back in April 2018, you know, sits down with the, the prime minister or president or, you know, gets almost like a, like a royal trip almost in a way. So I wonder if you were able to speak with him about, I think how that might have formed and constituted some of his ideas, just uh, maybe around community, around economics, around, you know, pride, the stuff, the kind of things that he read and the history that he, you know, he dug into and maybe even how it may have altered his path. I mean, I think 18, is, is, it, it says something to me and it's only crept into the interviews and a little bit in the music. So just, if you got to dig into that, that would have been fascinating to hear. Yeah, I'm, I'm glad you asked that. And um, yes, there's a whole chapter called Eritrea. And um, I used to call it Eritrea, but Nip corrected me and said it's Eritrea. Um, and so we did speak about it in our conversation. And I have researched um, other people that spoke to him about it and was able to also talk to Eritrean youth uh living in england um one one person in particular semi w was very helpful to me in um just understanding like what specifically uh you know nib's father was saying when he during the memorial service i don't know if you remember when he raised his fist and and you know said a phrase that's not um familiar to most people but it, it was uh you know nib's father was uh part of the struggle in between Ethiopia and Eritrea. And he came to the United States, um, you know, seeking asylum from a, you know, a conflict there. And so his, what he said was basically the equivalent of power to the people, um, you know, and it was a phrase that had great meaning for people involved in that struggle. Um, so, yeah, I mean, 
that whole trip is a tribute to Dawit Askadom and his uh, his knowledge of you know the importance of family and his uh, ongoing effort to keep his sons immersed in Eritrean culture. And also just, although um, Nip's mom and dad were no longer together, you know, um, his father was very much a big part of, you know, both of his son's lives. And he recognized that this was an important moment for Nip to kind of get away from what was happening in LA at that time. And um, in the uh, interviews, I learned that, you know, he was a little reluctant at first to go away for three months. That seemed like a long time to be away. Uh, you know, a couple of weeks maybe, but you know, he had a lot of business to attend to at that time and he didn't want to just walk away from that at that moment. But, um, and you can see his reluctance. I don't know if you've seen any of the clips on YouTube where his dad is talking to him, even on the plane, and he's like dressed like he's straight off the block in L.A. He's got the headphones and the baggy T-shirt, and, you know, and his dad's like, so are you excited to go back home? Are you excited? And, you know, he's like, yeah, it's cool, dad, you know. Um, but, yes, that trip was very important. There's a whole chapter in the book about it. And the second trip, you know, when he went the first time, he took some of his music there and he would go to a record shop in, in the neighborhood where they were staying in tell them I'm going to be a rapper. I'm going to be a famous rapper. You're going to hear about me one day. And sure enough, when he returned, he was a famous rapper. He had released an album that would go on to be Grammy nominated. He was, as you mentioned, you know, invited to sit down with the president. But I think the, the most amazing thing that happened on that trip was an interview that he gave. Um, there, there's two that I'm aware of. One with a, there was an on-camera interview which was cool, but the one with the Eritrean national newspaper, the reporter did a great job of just asking very fundamental, simple questions. She was not a very hip hop savvy person, but she just asked real basic questions like what is hip hop? And, you know, are gangs scary? And, you know, as Nip always would, he answered the questions very patiently and in great detail and took great, you know, put great effort into trying to convey these concepts in a very thoughtful way. And it's really in some ways, one of the most important interviews he ever did and very poignant to, to revisit. So I quote from that in the book and um, you know, he, one of the things speaking about the name Nipsey Hussle, you know, nobody knows who Nipsey Russell is in a reacher, very few people that, so that reference doesn't really resonate, but there's a word Nebsey which roughly means like homeboy or, you know, my friend. And um, so that's what people call him in Eritrea. And so the reporter said, is there anything you want to correct about that? And Nip said, no, that's great. I, I love that. You know, you go ahead with that. So yeah, it, that part is definitely in the book. It reminds me a little bit of Malcolm's trip to Mecca in certain ways, you know, um, but even, you know, going twice and connecting with family and all the things that he learned is, is deep part of the story. Well, thank you all. Um, I'm going to pause.